I'm Robert Burnett of Burnett Partners. Um, I want to speak to you about a very important subject in the hotel business, uh, residential branding fees. Are they worth it? I appreciate you allowing me to talk to you today about this. I want to discuss this revenue source um, that is so important to real estate projects and to hotel operators, the branding fee associated with the residential real estate and whether it's really worth it. The perspective I bring to the question is not that of a hotelier per se, but someone who works with uh, developers evaluating their options for the hospitality component of their project, um, having helping them decide whether they should have a hotel at all, if so, which brand, what size, um, and how it will interface uh, with the residential part of the project. I'm the person figuratively still in the room with the developer or the hedge fund or the private equity group, whoever is the sponsor, um, after the hotel representatives have toured the site and made their presentations. I want to offer, for your benefit, my candid observations <clears throat> on the universe of five-star brands and their future in destination resorts. Some explanation of my role is in order. And my professional focus for the last 30 plus years has been on the residential component of five-star destination resorts. To oversimplify our mandate, my team and I conceive the residential product. We create and execute the marketing strategy to reach the target markets. Um, and we pre-sell the units as early as possible, uh, uh, for the, as fast as possible for the highest possible prices. Now, the projects we work on almost invariably have a hotel. From our admittedly myopic uh, focus of the residential real estate, which um, for many developers is the main financial driver of the project, we the, view the hotel component in several ways. Number one, we see it as a magnet that draws um, prospective real estate purchasers. Number two, we see it as the entity that can share in the operating expense of the amenities. Number three, we see it as provider of services for the real estate owners. Now, I want to focus on, on number four, the brand and its real or imagined um, contributions and success of the residential component. From the residential perspective, ignoring for a moment the operating performance of the hotel, um, the conventional value proposition for encumbering a project with a 20 to 30 year uh, management contract, subordinating uh, the public persona of that project to somebody else's brand standards, and paying a hefty commission on each sale for the privilege of doing so, um, is that it will translate to a per square foot a price premium that we otherwise couldn't get. The off-sided premium, if you would believe the studies such as Knight Frank and so forth, is 20 to 25% over what we would otherwise uh, sell for. Well, I want to challenge the conventional wisdom, suggest that cracks are appearing in that value proposition, and explain what luxury hotel brands can do going forward to preserve their centrality in new resort developments. Well, why is this important to the hotel industry? Because branding and licensing fees to luxury hotel operators can be very significant, which it should seek to preserve. And because without a successful real estate program, the project itself can't succeed, and the success of that project uh, impacts the hotel's brand. First, the conventional wisdom. Implicit in the supposed real estate premium is the presumption that the committed loyal following will pay that premium because the hotel is branded. Years ago, we took on the challenge of turning around a real estate project in the Caribbean that had a, a five-star resort brand associated with it that was under construction. As part of uh, our assignment, we were uh, allowed to survey the top 1,500 clients of the operator to determine, among other things, why they had, would be willing to stay there or per, had purchased real estate there. Uh, we expected to see tremendous loyalty uh, from the respondents, given the prestige of the particular brand. Uh, but to our surprise, most response answers didn't indicate that there was anything unique about the brand or its locations but that the brand was figuratively a box to check for good service. In other words, it assured them that a baseline of services and design would be there, but little more. 
for this box to be checked, the developer had committed to pay 4% on every sale, which translated to many millions of dollars in fees. Was the branding fee paid by that developer or other developers really necessary? If the brand apparently didn't, judging from the feedback from the loyal followers, uh, create a perception that the resort was truly unique and worth more, um, then and it was just a box to check for service, could that pr price premium that we achieved uh, been achieved for a lot less money? The argument can be made, after all, that the world's most iconic hotels and resorts are unbranded, or more precisely, that they are the brand. A friend of mine in New York once said, Robert, if I told my friends I was moving into the Carlisle, they'd say, Steve, you hit a home run. If I told them I was moving into the Ritz-Carlton, they'd probably think I'd gotten divorced. Um, the, the, I, the, the point here is that, that a lot of the, the truly iconic hotels uh, of the world, um, Hotel de Cap in Antibes, the, the Ritz in Paris, La Mamunia in Marrakesh, um, the Hotel de Paris in Monte Carlo, um, or even closer to home where I live in Charleston, uh, the Cloisters at Sea Island or, or Blackberry Farm, uh, they're not part of hotel chains. Uh, some, like the Hotel de, Hotel de Cap, may be managed by a hotel chain, in this case, Oetker, but the hotel itself is the brand, not the hotel operator. My point here is that the notion that a brand makes a hotel truly iconic, which translates in this context to real estate value, is questionable. And the assumption that the highest uh, end hotels loyal guests translate to a significant real estate purchasers willing to pay a premium because of their brand is not necessarily so. At the Caribbean project that I mentioned earlier, we achieved the highest prices per square foot in the region at the time. But frankly, whether this was due to the brand or other factors such as the location is debatable. Which brings me to the second related question of the premium that's historically been achieved over local market norms. There are, in fact, branded residential developments that have achieved record-breaking prices in their market, um, and much more than, than, than local market comps. One Hyde Park in London uh, comes to mind, but I can't help it thinking of the old adage that success has many fathers and failures an orphan. In other words, was the success of One Hyde Park a success because it overlooks Hyde Park? or because it was managed by Mandarin Oriental, a brand, by the way, that I'm revere and that I'm working with. There are, in reality, many reasons that a residential resort project does or doesn't achieve premium pricing. London mentioned previously is just one example. I would suggest to you that the, in most major metropolitan markets, a five-star branded hotel is in a five-star location. However, that where a premier brand has been attached to a sub premier location. I can think of several examples. Real estate sales have not been successful. So it's not just the brand alone that carries it. In addition to the location, there are other factors impacting whether a branded project achieves premiums over local competitors. For example, there are established markets that despite their popularity and concentration of high net worth residents and visitors have aging residential inventory. In other words, the local competitive bar is relatively low one. Naples, Florida, where we're currently working, is one such example. Despite the, the fact that beachfront homes, if you can find one, sell for 40 to $50 million, only one new condominium project and not a beachfront one has been built in the last decade. Grand Cayman, another resort destination we're working in, has the highest standard of living in, in the Caribbean, average ADRs of $700 to $1,000 per night in high season, and it's the fourth or fifth largest financial center in the world. On Grand Cayman, there's only one branded project, a Ritz-Carlton that was built nearly 15 years ago. Other f factors in, impacting sales prices, Overall market conditions and timing, whether the unit mix was the right one, the sophistication of the marketing strategy and the people behind it, um, the resources committed by the developer uh, to executing the strategy, the effectiveness of the sales team, the list goes on. My point here is that any number of factors or combination of factors in reality determines the sales pricing and velocity and 
that to ascribe the outcome to the brand alone while useful in rationalizing the branding fee is not necessarily reflective of the real drivers of success or failure. I mentioned earlier that I see cracks appearing in the basic value proposition uh, offered by branded residences. What are those cracks and what can a five-star hotel operator do to address them? I've been part of meetings on major projects recently in which developers are starting to question the basic assumption that they need a brand at all to be successful or that a brand will deliver the price premium to justify the branding fees. Why are they doing this? I offer a few possible explanations and examples. First explanation is that in the five-star universe, you can count on one hand the number of hotel brands that would be suitable for, let alone in truly enhance an ultra-luxury residential project. The quote-unquote usual suspects hotel brands with established residential track records and international clientele, reservation system and infrastructure are very few and far between and have thresholds of size for what they will and won't manage, which further narrows the choice to a developer. Newer entrants in this uh, underserved universe, such as Baccarat and Pendry, are still building their track record in the residential space, and some major projects don't want to be a guinea pig. The second explanation is that you have to, that if you have a project that's already planning to price itself at the very top of the market, is it really realistic to think that a hotel brand is going to achieve 25% more than, than we're already asking uh, the often quoted premium? Uh, another uh, reason the value proposition may be showing cracks has to do with the nature of any luxury brand and in, in its mission to grow uh, its revenues by constantly expanding its portfolio, uh, which ultimately dilutes its own exclusivity and rarity, and for real estate sales, the value to us. In the luxury goods space, you have to look no farther than Hermes, um, which you can buy in an airport. They have 340 stores in the world and counting. How truly exclusive they can, can they be? Um, in the hotel space, when I started working with Adrian Zeka at Amman Resorts, they had 14 resorts worldwide. Today, there are 32 and eight more in the pipeline. There are only so many glamorous locales in the world. And if you're represented there already and you need to keep growing, you have to move to secondary locations. This is why you see Four Seasons in uh, cities like Baltimore and St. Louis and Minneapolis and other very nice but less than jet set uh, locations. It's why Ritz-Carlton Hotels, part of Marriott, which grew to 108 hotels with re reportedly 48 more in the pipeline, is no longer considered a true asset for some five-star ultra-luxury ultra resort projects. And, and they needed to spawn a smaller, more sub, uh, exclusive sub-brand Ritz Reserve. My point here is that even the most exclusive brands grow uh, to ultimately dilute themselves by sheer numbers, sameness, and association with secondary locations. And as a hotel becomes more diluted, so does its value proposition for the real estate. So what can five-star operators do to secure their centrality in the luxury resort and residential sector? I would suggest several things for them to consider. First, Hoteliers need to weigh the imperative to grow against the dilution of their brand equity. The more projects a hotel brand has, the less exclusive and hence less valuable they are as a driver of real estate sales. What that magic number is, I don't know. But I can point to certain hotel flags that have effectively taken themselves out of serious consent contention in the ultra-luxury development arena because they've become frankly commonplace. Uh, that may have been a conscious strategic business decision rather than an unintended consequence, but it still is a cautionary tale for any hotel operator that wants to preserve an aura of exclusivity. Second, let's be realistic about um, what branding a residence really brings. In most cases, the brand today is not a driver of price. Uh, but an insurance policy, an insurance policy that some portion of the real estate prospects will be comforted uh, that they'll receive a certain level of design and service and quality, removing a, a possible sales objection. 
So the question is, is that insurance policy, policy worth three to 4% of gross real estate sales? Maybe. Third, I propose that for a, a brand to translate to real value for real estate, that the brand has to stand for more than generic terms like service and luxury. The trend at the upper end of the market is, is uh, not towards predictability and sameness, but towards unique, local, distinctive experiences, meaning baseline expectations of good service are not, in more and more experienced developers' minds, worth the insurance premium. Pro projecting core values that are aligned with the, a segment of the target market is what resonates. In its early days, I mentioned Amman Resorts. They stood for a serene uh, Asian aesthetic, exotic locations, and, and almost an artisanal embrace of the, the local culture. They had true groupies as a result that would pay New York prices in a third world country. If uh, wellness and environmental sensitivity uh, is what's important to you, you may well pay a price premium to have a, a home at a six senses resort because that's integral to their brand DNA. Um, Mandarin Oriel has more Michelin starred restaurants than any hotel operator. So you can be assured that you're going to have superb cuisine. You may pay a premium for that. My point is that hotel dry brands to drive real value for real estate cannot be all things to all rich people. They need to resist homogeneity and stand for something unique by aligning themselves with the core values of a segment of the market they create true loyalty that translates to true real estate premiums. Fourth, I want to suggest that hotel operators need to pay closer attention and bring true expertise to the real estate markets that they're in. All too often, uh, the hotel operators are basically custodians of their brand rather than true contributors to the project's success. Home hotel management would be well advised to take the time to truly understand the dynamics of the markets their projects are in and bring value to the team with true marketing expertise. In most cases, too few people oversee too many projects and don't have the time or inclination to really immerse themselves in the markets where the projects are located to make informed judgment about whether the residences make sense in the first place, what type of residence it should be, and what they can realistically sell for and how they should be marketed. If they would bring this value, it would help justify the expense. It, it also is in their self-interest because the success of the real estate, the residential product determines the financial success of the project itself, which in turn reflects on the brand. Fifth, for the money that developers pay, luxury hotel operators need to be more creative and proactive in providing access to their customers. I recognize the need to uh, shield a customer base from being bombarded with marketing materials from dozens of different projects, but access is often limited to a single market initiative for the client base, the, pri and the privilege of buying an advertisement in the brand's magazine, and the possibility of sponsoring a few special events at other hotels. There has to be a more creative way to bring new projects to the attention of a client base while protecting that client base from abuse. And finally, residents and prospective residences need to be recognized as valued investors that they really are. Someone who commits millions of dollars to a hotel branded project is different than someone spending a few thousand dollars and deserves more than a small discount on a massage or a meal. If hotels regarded their residents as an honored elite rather than an occupier of inventory that the hotel brand could otherwise rent out, which unfortunately is often the case, it would help the developer sales and further strengthen the value proposition of the hotel brand. Some brands like Mandarin with their newly revived residence elite program are paying more attention to residential owners. I encourage other brands to pay closer attention to the residents and prospective residents. As someone who's held responsible for the real estate sales, I support the idea of branded residents. I work with them all the time, but I believe that to preserve their importance in the residential sphere, they have to earn their branding fees more proactively and more creatively than they have in the past. Thank you again for letting me share ideas and observation from a long career in our shared industry.